All right, let's try this again. Um, welcome to my Facebook Live. I am Dr. Patel. Um, hope you all had a great week, and I apologize about the technical difficulties that we're having, but I think we are up and running. So today we're going to be talking about knee osteoarthritis. Uh, last week we talked, um, or a couple weeks ago, we talked about the knee anatomy. Um, and then last week we talked about uh, ACL tears. Uh, and this week we're going to talk about probably one of the most common things that affects everybody uh, in one way, shape, or form as we get older is knee osteoarthritis. So um, without further ado, actually, before I get back into the details of knee osteoarthritis, I just want to say that if you do have any questions or concerns or if you want to, uh, if you want me to go over any specific topics, then please feel free to reach out. You can comment, DM, uh, email us at info at fxregencenter.com. Today we're going to go over knee osteoarthritis, and then we're going to move on to different types of topics, including um, when um, is surgery absolutely necessary for knee osteoarthritis and other conditions, um, when when are conventional, traditional treatments very reasonable options, um, and, and why or when should we avoid those traditional treatments such as surgery um, with, with healthy, natural ways of improving our knees. So stay tuned, um, and again, if you have any ideas, questions, thoughts, or suggestions, please feel free to reach out. So now, without further ado, uh, we're going to go over knee osteoarthritis. So before I get into these x-rays um, that I have here, I'm going to review the anatomy a little bit, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, what happens when we get knee osteoarthritis. So just to make my crew little drawings, as I always do, um, this is going to be a front view of your knee. So this is your thigh bone here called the femur. Here is your lower leg bone, your main lower leg bone called the tibia, and its partner off to the side called the fibula. This is your right knee looking straight at it. So this is the right side of your right knee. This is your left side of your right knee. And where the thigh bone and the lower leg bones meet, um, we have these shock absorbers called the meniscus. Okay, And these menisci are these um, ring-shaped structures, and we're looking at them three-dimensionally here, so they look kind of like this. Okay, And if you look at them straight up and down, well, they're going to look more like so. Okay, But basically, if you took that and turned it sideways, that's what we're looking at over here, and those are the shock absorbers. There's one on the inside part of the knee called the medial meniscus, one on the outside part of the knee called the lateral meniscus. We have this smooth surface of the joint called the cartilage. And this smooth surface basically covers um, all of uh, the bones here, where one bone meets another bone. So you have smooth surface covering uh, the femur over here, as well as covering the tib uh, tibia over here. And this is the smooth surface. Think of it as like the pavement that allows for nice smooth movement. And it extends to the front of the knee like so, because when you bend your knee um, back and forth, that is a part that is actually um, essentially rubbing um, here to here, okay? Um, and then we have the ligament structures like the ACL we talked about last week, right? So that's the ACL that goes across here. Um, you have your uh, PCL uh, that goes behind it. You have your um, lateral collateral ligament on this side, and then you have your medial collateral ligament on this side. And the ligaments are the supportive structures, the duct tape, so to speak, um, or as I like to describe them, as you may have heard from me before, those thick rubber bands that surround broccoli in the grocery store. So nice supportive structures. This ends up being an important discussion because as we talk about what happens in osteoarthritis, um, the ligaments and the meniscus and the cartilage are all actually involved in one way, shape, or form. 
So I'm gonna zoom myself in a little bit here and show you a knee model. Okay, so here is a knee model, again, looking straight at my right knee here. This is the thigh bone, the lower leg bones, the kneecap that sits in the front, which is not in my drawing over there. Um, and you have your meniscus on either side, your medial meniscus on the inside, your lateral meniscus on the outside. You have your ligaments, your MCL, your LCL on this side, your ACL and your PCL behind it. And then you have your bluish gray surface is the cartilage. Again, that's the nice smooth surface that allows for nice smooth movement, okay? Now, in general, as we get older, our knees actually start to bow outwards or they start to get knock kneed. So you either start to bow outwards or you start to get knock kneed. And as that occurs, the majority of people, their knees start to bow outwards. So as that occurs, the knee bows outwards and you can see there's more pressure that's placed on the inside of the knee. Now obviously I'm exaggerating here, but you can see that there's more pressure that's placed on the inside of the knee. So what does that look like when we look at our um, knee uh, example here? What happens is that this knee here, <clears throat> this part of the knee, the femur, right, actually ends up turning like so. So as that occurs, you can see that the medial meniscus on this side, the medial meniscus here, let's get that all out of the way, but the medial meniscus has more pressure on it while there's actually gapping or widening of the lateral compartment or the outside of the knee. So as that medial meniscus gets pressure here, right? I mentioned the meniscus is like the shock absorber of our knees, right? If that shock absorber is constantly getting more pressure because our, our knee is bowing outwards, um, then, then that basically is the equivalent of us loading up one side of your car and driving for a thousand miles, right? If you load up one side of your car and you drive for a thousand miles, what's gonna happen? The shocks on that side are gonna start to wear out. So that medial meniscus starts to get more degenerative tearing to occur. So that medial meniscus starts to start fraying, it starts getting cracks in it, it may get some splits or tears, but over time, that meniscus starts to degenerate. Now, as that degeneration occurs, right? As that degeneration occurs in that medial meniscus, well then over time, there's more friction, more pressure that's being placed into the cartilage. So this cartilage ends up getting cracks in it. This cartilage ends up starting to get worn out. And eventually over time, some pieces of the cartilage start to um, go away, right? There's, there's holes or potholes in the cartilage that start to occur. Okay, and basically you start to get these fissuring or damage to that cartilage, really some quote unquote wear and tear. As that wear and tear occurs in that cartilage, the bone underneath the cartilage starts to get rougher. So if you think of the cartilage as pavement, um, and if you think of the, the degeneration or, or wear and tear of the pavement as potholes, right? If, if there's no improvement of the potholes that takes place, right? If we don't repave the pavement, um, then, the, then the ground underneath is gonna start to get rougher. And that's ultimately what happens with osteoarthritis. So the bone starts to get little divots in it, in some areas, when you put pressure on the bone, the bone's like, hey, there's a lot of pressure on me. I gotta bulk up in order to provide some support. So the bone can actually get bulkier. And when it forms little um, chunks of bone that increase in size, those are called bone spurs. Eventually, over time, 
the bone starts to get a bruised appearance because as we continue to put pressure onto the bone, then the, the, the blood supply starts to get stagnant there and the bone starts to uh, get bruised and eventually that bone starts to break down. Now, that is kind of the whole spectrum of degeneration that occurs when we have osteoarthritis, right? It starts with a little gentle bowing of our knee and, it's, and, and it ends up putting pressure on one compartment of the knee. The meniscus starts to degenerate. The shock absorber starts to get less shock absorby. Um, the cartilage starts to wear away. Then the bone underneath starts to change. Now there's one other factor that needs to be considered as well. Because as the knee starts to bow outwards, right? As the knee starts to bow outwards, the lateral menis, sorry, the lateral collateral ligament over here, this lateral collateral ligament ends up starting to get stretched, right? Can you picture that? Um, so as the knee starts to bow outwards, right? The lateral collateral ligament starts to get stretched. Now that's important. Now remember these are those thick rubber bands that surround broccoli in the grocery store. So if that thick rubber band is slowly, 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 slowly stretched over time, then that rubber band is gonna get looser. That rubber band is gonna get looser. That then allows for that need to then bow out more, right? That then allows for the knee to bow out more. So then ultimately what ends up happening is that over time, that knee starts to bow more and more outwards. We get more and more deformity as that ligament stretches, okay? Um, that in combination with that meniscus, that, that degeneration of the meniscus, the shock absorber getting less shock absorber, that combination of things allows for more and more deformity to take place. And ultimately that puts more and more pressure um, onto the inside of the knee okay and basically the, this the same concept the opposite is true if we're getting knock kneed right if we're getting knock kneed then the knee is going inwards and that is ultimately going to cause stretching of the mcl and pressure onto the lateral meniscus but ultimately the story is the same whether you're bowing outwards or inwards there's an imbalance of structures there's some loosening of ligaments there's some decrease in the shock absorber of the meniscus, and then there's wear and tear of the cartilage and ultimately the bone underneath. Um, now, the, the final thing that I wanna mention about this is I've, I've kind of described the whole spectrum of what osteoarthritis is, um, but I didn't address the, you know, the elephant in the room, which is, does it cause pain, right? Because the reality is with the exception of when the bone is actually breaking down and dying, right? With the exception of those end end stages of osteoarthritis, uh, the remaining spectrum of osteoarthritis from mild to even severe osteoarthritis does not have to equal pain. In fact, it is very, very common for us to have osteoarthritis and have zero pain associated with it. In fact, I've seen patients come to me and say, hey, doc, my right knee's killing me, and I look at them and their left knee has more arthritis than their right knee. So the question is why, right? Why does pain occur? Um, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but um, what I do want to do is go over some imaging because I do think it's important for us to understand when, when is it that we have mild, moderate, severe osteoarthritis um, what is the grading system that's used when we look at knees? What do your knees look like on x-ray? What do your knees look like on MRI? And I'm gonna go through that right now. So, so first and foremost, when we look at um, the knee under x-ray, I wanna show you what normal looks like. So first thing we're gonna look at is this picture on uh, the right of the screen here. Um, and right at the screen, left of the screen, I don't even know which direction I'm looking at. Uh, but this picture here that you can see um, is what's called a grade one osteoarthritis um, in what's called a Kellgren-Lawrence scale. 
Um, and this grading system is, uh, is actually from 0 to 4. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the grading system. Um, and this basically shows what the different types of uh, arthritis or different severity uh, looks like um, as the arthritis actually progresses. So, you know, before I even look at this grade one osteoarthritis, I kind of want to show you what a completely normal look knee looks like. And we're going to our good friend Google to show you here what a normal knee looks like. Why do I know this is a normal knee? Because it says normal knee right there. No, so when we look at this knee, um, I'm gonna go through some of the anatomy of this knee again, um, just so we're on the same page here is our femur right? and here is our kneecap that we see sitting in the front which I which we did not see in my previous drawing here is your tibia and here is your fibula right here okay what we don't see in the x-ray and this is something that's a common misconception is you'll go to um, your, your, your doctor, your physician, your chiropractor, your somebody, and they'll take an x-ray of the knee and they'll say, oh, you're losing cartilage, or, or your meniscus is gone. And the reality is that we can't get a firm grasp of what MRI or cartilage looks like on x-ray. X-ray is really, really great at looking at the bone. It can look at some things like the joint space, but it can't look at the cartilage itself and it can't look at the meniscus or the shock absorbers. But where those things would be is the meniscus would be sitting right here and right here. So this is the medial meniscus and this is the lateral meniscus. And what you'd see is um, the cartilage would be around here, right? All of this would be cartilage and there'd be cartilage sitting over there as well. And then you'd have your ACL, your PCL, your LCL or lateral collateral ligament and your MCL, okay? And that's essentially what your knee would look like um, if it had the soft tissue structures in it. But on an X-ray, again, there are no soft tissue structures that are there, okay? Um, but again, I wanna show you um, just what that normal x-ray would look like again. So we have that as a frame of reference. Basically, there's plenty of room between the bones here. Um, there's, no, there's smoothness to the bone throughout. There's no little spikes or what we call osteophytes sticking out anywhere. Um, basically, this is what a normal knee looks like, okay? Now, when we go to a grade one osteoarthritis, um, basically, the, the, the thing about grade one osteoarthritis is for all intents and purposes, there's not a lot going on, right? There's not a lot going on. Um, there's possibly, possibly a little bit of some bone spurring occurring. And that's what we see with this little white um, uh, arrow over here is just a little bit of bone spurring that's occurring right here. Um, and perhaps some little changes in the bone in other areas as well. But basically, that little spike that we see in this region is what we're considering some possible little osteophytes or bone spurring that's occurring. Um, but for all intents and purposes, um, really no change in the joint space. The joint space or the space between these bones is actually pretty normal, and, and that's why this is considered a grade one, okay? Now, when we look at grade two, in contrast, I'm gonna shrink this down just a little bit so we can see it clearly. Grade two in contrast, or maybe I'll slip, there we go. Grade two in contrast is when we're definitely seeing some osteophytes or bone spurring that's forming, right? When we look at this one over here on um, uh, that says B, uh, we could see that where this arrow is pointing to right here, right? 
that is definitely some roughness to the bone that counts as a bone spur. You see, for example, the contour of the bone on this side is nice and smooth, whereas the contour of the bone over here has some rigidness, okay? So that is definitely some bone spurring that is starting to occur. And then as far as the joint space is concerned, now we're possibly having some decrease in the joint space over in this region over here compared to this region over here. Okay, um, so grade one is possible bone spurring without any significant loss of uh, joint space. Grade two is definite osteophyte or bone spurring occurring and possibly some change in your um, uh, joint space narrowing. Okay, now when we go from here, we'll go over to what a grade three and grade four osteoarthritis look like. And if I can find it, here is now what grade two and grade three look like. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and look at grade three first. So grade three, again, we definitely have bone spurs forming, and now we're having more than one. Um, we have multiple osteophytes or bone spurs occurring. You can see them here at both of these arrows, that spikiness to the bone here. You're actually seeing a little bit of that occurring on the outside of the knee as well. So all of this is a component of what are called multiple osteophytes or significantly more bone spurs. And then now, whereas in grade two, we had possible joint space narrowing, now in grade three, we definitely have some joint space narrowing, um, which is occurring right here, right, compared to here. Now the joint space has definitely narrowed, and that's why we're over into the grade three category, okay? When we go into grade four, this is where things get more severe. Um, definitely multiple and even larger osteophytes at this point. Um, you could see that you know, the osteophyte over here in grade three was still relatively small, um, but in this over here has grown in size substantially. Um, and grade four is when there is significant increase in osteophytes, particularly their size, and as well as severe joint space narrowing, which is clearly seen in these areas here, okay? So all in all, what we're talking about is a you know, four grade system, um, five if you call it, called normal, a part of the grade, right? Um, so there's grade zero, which is normal, grade one, which says A, um, small potential osteophytes with no joint space narrowing, grade two, which is definite osteophytes um, with possible joint space narrowing, uh, grade three with multiple osteophytes and definite joint space narrowing, and grade four, which is bigger osteophytes and definite severe joint space narrowing. Um, and this is really, again, the severity of the osteoarthritis, um, but this doesn't really mention pain because quite frankly, people could live in all four of these stages and have no pain associated with it. Now, what X-ray does a great job showing is the bone um, and it could even show the quality of the bone underneath the cartilage somewhat. Sometimes we can see when there's sclerosis or damage to the bone underneath the cartilage. But ultimately, we can't see um, what the cartilage looks like. We can't see uh, the best picture of what the bone looks like. Um, and we can't um, you know, see if there's any damage or issues with the meniscus either. Um, so that's where things like MRI come into play. Now. I'm gonna show you um, an example of an MRI of basically what looks like a normal knee here, um, or close to normal knee. Um, and here we go, let's see. And this is an MRI of the knee. So again, we're gonna look at, this is the thigh bone, this is the lower leg bone, the tibia, uh, the fibula would be over here. These black triangles that we see are the meniscus on either side. Um, this grayish line that we see next to the bone, uh, in between the bone and the meniscus, that's the cartilage. 
and then this is the ACL over here. Um, to be frank, this, this knee does have some arthritis that's going on because we see that the gray line of the cartilage has started to decrease here. And there is some little nicking um, or a little degenerative tearing of the meniscus on this side as well. So even this isn't the greatest example of a normal knee, but for all intents and purposes, this is probably as normal as I'm going to see in my clinic. Um, I'll show you um, what it looks like when the knee starts to get a little bit more degeneration or more osteoarthritis. Um, and that is now over here. So this is a left knee. Um, this is the right side of the left knee. This is the left side of the left knee. Um, the thigh bone, the femur again, and the lower leg bone, the tibia, the meniscus on either side. And here we could see that this gray cartilage is decreased over here. You could see how that gray cartilage starts and then starts to disappear as it turns white over here. You see a little bit of that going on on this outside of the knee. Again, this is what cartilage loss looks like. This is when the cartilage is starting to wear away um, and that is a part of the degeneration of the joint. Um, and again, this is not something that could be seen on x-ray. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of, uh, of a knee that has had significant loss of cartilage. Um, so here is another picture here. Um, this is another left knee where you can see some of the cartilage over here. And even here, it's kind of splotchy. There's some white signal in it. Um, you can see some of that cartilage here, but it's significantly thinned. Um, and you see cartilage over here on the, the lateral femur. Um, but on the tibia over here, that cartilage is substantially decreased. You don't see really much of anything in terms of gray cartilage here. It's all sort of white. Um, and that's an example of the cartilage um, wearing away substantially. And the other thing that I want to point out here is not only is the cartilage worn away here, but you're also starting to appreciate a little bit of bruising inside the bone. So this black bone here that's fairly black throughout, you can see that there's some areas where there's some increased white signal. There's some of those areas in other spots as well. Um, but certainly in this area here, underneath the area where the cartilage is decreased. And then I'm going to show you what more significant uh, bone bruising looks like in this next image. So then this is an example of a knee that is worsened even more than the other one. So again, um, on this side of the knee, you see some gray cartilage, but that's starting to wear away here. On this side of the knee, again, you see some gray cartilage, but that's worn away substantially here. And what's notable on this knee is whereas while you see the meniscus over here, this black triangle, really don't see much of the meniscus over here. In fact, this is some of the meniscus that's kind of squeezed out from inside the knee joint here. Um, but this is actually a patient that had an arthroscopic surgery in which a part of the meniscus was removed. And that's what ultimately, since part of the meniscus was removed, that ultimately made the arthritis worsen. And you see the cartilage is gone here, and now we have some more significant bruising of the bone on both sides. Okay, um, And you have these little white marks here, um, as well as this white marks here. These are examples of little pockets of inflammation, or what are called cysts. So this is what it looks like as knee arthritis actually progressively worsens. So, you know, this is the type of situation that then can cause pain when we start to develop this bruising, this irritation of the bone underneath the cartilage. Um, but, you know, I wanted to talk about wh when does arthritis cause pain and when does it not, right? Um, I mentioned that the, the end stages of osteoarthritis certainly can cause pain more frequently, but the remainder of the spectrum of osteoarthritis does not necessarily cause pain. So why is that? Um, is, does degenerative meniscus tearing cause pain? Um, well, the theory is no. You know, the degenerative meniscus tearing, the, the wear and tear of the shock absorber, does not necessarily cause pain. Different story if we had a sudden injury and the meniscus got torn, that might be a more substantial pain generator, but the meniscus itself degenerating, not necessarily. 
Does the cartilage cause pain? Now, this is of, of pretty big controversy here. If you're young and you have an injury and suddenly a piece of cartilage gets broken off, right? If you have a sudden injury and you have a pothole inside the uh, pavement, then that's the type of cartilage injury that might actually cause pain. But in actuality, when the cartilage is slowly wearing down over time, that cartilage loss does not necessarily equal pain. But the bone underneath the cartilage, once that starts getting involved, that can certainly be a pain generator. So it's really, really important to recognize that when, when, you, when you talk to somebody that talks about things like stem cell treatments, um, when we have arthritis, we're not regrowing the cartilage. Um, and that's the common misconception. And the truth is, I don't care about regrowing the cartilage because we see so many patients that have no cartilage and have no pain. So what, what is it that's causing pain? Why, is the, why does the joint get inflamed or irritated? Well, one of the theories is that as arthritis worsens, as the joint starts to degenerate more, the local environment is not as healthy. So we have stem cells that live in each of our joints, and those stem cells live in the bone underneath the cartilage. Um, a lot of these cells are actually um, sticking to uh, blood vessels, and they're they're um, you know hanging out, living on these blood vessels, tiny tiny blood vessels um, that are in, in, inside the bone. Now, as the arthritis worsens, that local environment, those local uh, cells that live in the bone actually stop to work appropriately. And there's some interesting research that shows that our progenitor cells or the stem cells that live inside joints actually progressively decline or decrease as we get older. And this was shown in knee osteoarthritis. Um, and interestingly, it was also shown in um, you know large full thickness rotator cuff tears like in the shoulder. Um, but the point is that as a joint degenerates, the local environment, the local stem cells that live in the joint are not as healthy. Why does that play a factor? Is that the thing that causes pain? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, the, the one theory is the reason, um, and there's different types of, of pain that's associated with osteoarthritis. One type is when there's inflammation that occurs. Um, and you may have heard me say this in the past, but inflammation is actually the first part of the healing process. Inflammation is a good thing. When we get an injury, inflammation is the initial response to the body to damaged tissue. So if you're ever a kid and twisted your ankle and your ankle swelled up, that's inflammation. That's your blood and your blood platelets coming to the area to stop any bleeding. That's growth factors that are being released and cells coming to the area to get rid of the damaged tissue, like macrophages coming to the area to get rid of the damaged tissue. And that's stem cells, your local stem cells coming to the area to then coordinate the orchestra or, or whatever uh, um, in regards to healing. Um, to, now, the way that I describe this is that, 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 that initial inflammation is your demolition day of a home reconstruction. Right? It's technically a negative process because it's getting rid of your old kitchen cabinets, but it's the positive process because it's making way for new. Right? And your local stem cells are the foremen of the construction project. And they're the ones that are in charge. They're the ones that are given instructions. So in a, no a normal, healthy joint without osteoarthritis, when we get an injury, if we walk funny, if we twist our knee, if we fall on our knee, well, we get inflammation, we get swelling, but then that swelling goes away as healing takes place. But if our local stem cells are not working properly, right? If our foremen of the construction site are lazy, if they're not working the way that they should be, then instead of that demolition day coming and going, we get stuck in demolition day, right? Now, instead of just taking off the kitchen cabinets, now we're taking off the drywall too. And that is how that osteoarthritis progressively worsens. So when we have that osteoarthritis that's worsening, it's easier for a joint to get irritated because our environment can't respond to the injury. And it's our easier for that joint to stay irritated or stay in inflammation. But why does a joint not cause pain? Well, if we're moving correctly, 
and if we're strengthening the muscles around our knees and if we're strengthening the muscles around our hips and our ankles and our feet and our back you know, all the things that are involved with walking in a correct manner um, and as long as we're avoiding any major injuries then a knee that has osteoarthritis does not necessarily equal pain but if we're walking funny if we're not strengthening our muscles if we're not uh, if if we're twisting our knee or lifting things improperly or doing things that can aggravate our knee well that's a situation that the arthritis can get flared up um, and and on that inflammation note you know if we are doing things in an unhealthy way and uh, and, and are predisposing our bodies to have inflammation if we're eating crappy food if we're drinking tons of alcohol you know things that can cause us to increase or upregulate the amount of inflammation we have globally through our body well that can certainly add fuel to the fire um, so all in all um, you know, I hope that all made sense. You know, when we talk about osteoarthritis, there's a lot of stuff um, that, that, you know, uh, that means. Um, osteoarthritis is a spectrum. It's a, a, a continuum that starts, quite frankly, when we're like 20 or 30 years old and sometimes even younger. Um, it's a degenerative process. It's wear and tear, but it's normal. And it's a normal progress as we get older and does not necessarily equal pain as long as we are moving correctly. If we find ourselves in stage one or stage two, the way to prevent ourselves from becoming stage three and stage four is by taking care of our bodies, taking care of our nutrition, as well as taking care of our muscles, strengthening them, preventing things from getting worse. Um, and there are things that we can do to strengthen some of the soft tissue structures and improve the biology of the joint. There are also things that we can do to make things worse. Um, so obviously not paying attention to our nutrition, not paying attention to our exercise, but also um, if your knee is bothering you, um, perhaps if you're young and otherwise healthy, getting one corticosteroid injection is not the end of the world, but there's research that shows that cortisone and especially repeated cortisone can actually make arthritis worse. Even numbing solution injected into the knee can actually have a negative impact on cartilage as well. So all in all, there's a lot of things um, that we can do to make arthritis pain better. There's a lot of things that we can do to prevent arthritis from getting worse. There's a lot of things that we need to avoid as well. And I wanna go more into details in regards to different types of treatment options, including the, the you know, um, more traditional things like cortisone injections, the gel injections, um, as well as different surgery options. And I'm gonna go through um, you know, other ways of managing knee arthritis that are more natural, more healthy, and things that I recommend for my patients. Um, but today's point was to overview what osteoarthritis is, what it looks like on your imaging. Um, and I hope that I was clear in getting those points across. But um, you know, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, if, if none of that made sense or if all of it made sense, feel free to comment, um, drop me a line. You can DM um, or uh, email us at info at fxregencenter.com. If you wanna talk about your specific situation, I'd be more than happy to help you out. Feel free to reach out to us at info at fxregencenter.com or you can call us at 310-929-9790. Um, touch base, let us know what you want me to talk about next. Um, next time I will be talking more about treatment options and then we'll go from there. So I hope you guys had a great day. I um, hope this was beneficial for you. If you did like it, please share it. Please like it. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys next week.